noisy, right? Doesn't it feel noisy in the culture in the world right now? Just so many messages coming at us, trying to tell us how to think or believe, what to feel, or, or where to place even our hope. And today, as we wrap up this series called Beyond the Noise, where we've been looking at the minor prophets, this group of interesting characters from the Old Testament from eight to 500 years before Christ came, we've been listening, trying to grasp Like, what is the real truth that we all need to hold on to? And we found over the last few weeks that even if or even when the the culture is loud, even when our situation is, is loud, that there's the opportunity, in fact, it's an invitation to come and hear what really matters and to find what's most important. This week, I was reading an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, about Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple. Uh, Fascinating article. It was all kind of about his life, but there's one quote that stuck out to me. It said, if you really want to understand Tim Cook, you have to understand this phrase that he says all the time. And the phrase is this, tomorrow is better than today. In fact, Tim goes on to say, there may not be a more important philosophy in life. It's something we all need to hold on to, not only hold on to it, but feel accountable for passing it on. Tomorrow is better than today. You might summarize what he's trying to speak with this word, hope. The belief that tomorrow is better than today. How many of you feel like that you have something that you are hoping for right now? There's something in your mind, something that's not here yet, but you just believe it's possible that that thing, that answer to prayer, that difficult situation, that season that you're in, that it all might be over. You hope that one day things will be different. This season in Advent is such a great time to be people of hope because we are constantly reminded, as Shannon just told us, of the fact that when God made a promise that one day he would come in Christ, and we're going to look at that in just a moment, that he actually keeps his promise. And we can have hope, not because it's good vibes or a lot of optimism, but because there's a basis for that hope. In fact, biblical hope is is a little different than just regular old cultural hope. Like cultural hope can be things like uh, a belief that things are good. Like um, Clark Griswold, any of you watched uh, Christmas Vacation yet? Okay, yeah, you've already seen it, right? Uh, This year, Uh, Clark Griswold, he hopes that Cousin Eddie doesn't show up this time, right? That's, That's his hope, his desire for something good. But hope also is the good thing that we're hoping for. Like Clark Griswold might say, my hope is that Cousin Eddie stays in the RV somewhere else, like Kansas. That, that hope, the thing, is hope. And that's sort of where cultural hope stops. A belief that something could happen or the thing we hope happens, but biblical hope adds another ingredient to the mix. It's a basis for that belief that's unshakable. In fact, according to the Bible, hope is this. It's the confident expectation of receiving good in the future, based on God's promise-keeping ability and past. Biblical hope is the fact that we know that something good is coming despite what it may look like around us right now, despite what we may feel, we believe because God is a promise-keeper who never changes that good is yet to come, even if I can't put my hands around it. And that is the major theme of the guy we're going to look at today as we close this series out. His name was Zechariah, and Zechariah's main message is the hope of restoration. In fact, right at the beginning of his book, in Zechariah 1, verse 2, he says, Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you. In other words, if you want the restoration, if you want your hope to become reality, return to me. In the next few minutes, I'm going to show you several verses from Zechariah's book. It's wild. Uh, If you've ever tried to read it, it is intense and complicated and makes you feel like you're on some sort of a trip because that's kind of the way that it gets posed to us. And we're going to make sense of all of it in the next 25 minutes and leave you with one question, one thing to do at the end of all this. You ready? I'm going to talk fast. Okay, 
Zechariah's message, hope, restoration. Here's his context first. Zechariah started speaking to the people of Israel in November of 520 BC. Now you say that's really specific. And it is, because we know from the chronicles of history exactly when he began to talk and teach and exactly when he finished. And 520 BC just seems like some other world, right? It's like you can't even imagine what that is. So let me kind of situate it for you. Uh, The people of Israel... We remember this, they had gone into slavery, into exile, uh, first by the Babylonians and the Persians overtook them. And then some of the Persian kings, one guy named Cyrus, he sent them back home. It says in the scriptures that God used this man who was not a follower of God to do something good, to send the people back to Jerusalem. He sent them back and he said, rebuild your walls, rebuild your temple, go live your life. And that got followed by a guy named Darius, who was a king, and Darius went even further. He actually helped pay for the people to rebuild the center of their life, the the temple in Jerusalem. They had started and, and built these walls to provide safety around them. And Darius was the king. And then Zechariah kind of lives a little longer than Darius into a guy that you've heard of before, another king of Persia, one of the most famous, and his name is Xerxes. And you know Xerxes from the movie 300. Do you remember this cat? Uh, The one on the right, they're like, that's Xerxes. Xerxes, the king, the emperor of Persia. He was feared. He was powerful. His people believed he was a god. But uh, Zechariah lived during this time. Xerxes looked more like the thing on the left than the guy on the right. But, But still, it was a formidable character. And you also know Xerxes because he married someone famous. So I'm gonna pull it all together for you. Anybody know who Xerxes married? Esther. Remember that story of Esther the queen? And maybe I was born for such a time as this. That's who she married in a beauty pageant to end all beauty pageants. You can go read about that yourself. But this is the time in which Zechariah is speaking. And his message of hope is in the context of a guy like Xerxes, of a world out of control, of their life looking like ruins with no possibility to believe in hope for the future. It was difficult to hold on to hope. They had been prisoners in the most powerful empire in the world. And how now are they gonna be able to grasp onto the belief that God has something good in the future? Here's how he does it. First, Zechariah in chapters one through eight, he gives these what are known as apocalyptic visions. He has eight visions at night while he sleeps, eight dreams. And his dreams are kind of like your dreams, but on steroids. I asked uh, ChatGPT to do a picture for me, generate an image that summarizes Zechariah's dreams. This is what it gave, and it's pretty close. Is that a fever dream or what? Can you imagine? So in his dreams, he's got flying horses of different colors, like the four horsemen. You remember the four horsemen? You've heard of them before, of the apocalypse. That comes from Zechariah. He's got this flying scroll that beats people up and gets them in shape. He's got a a golden lamp, saying, you can put the picture back up, that's filled with oil from these two olive trees and these shadowy figures. It is wild. And the reason it's so wild is because sometimes when we've lost hope, we need more than just logic or evidence, we need our imagination. The prophets often spoke with imagery, with sensory language, to try to help capture the imaginations of the people because just facts would not do it. So Zechariah tells them about all these crazy things that are gonna happen. Each one of those is some uh, form of God's coming restoration of his promise to show up in ways that astound them. And so the people over the course of a few years hear these visions and Zechariah, he's developed a, a reputation. I mean, they think of him like that guy. He's the one proclaiming hope when all around all they see is like devastation. And so it's kind of hard to believe him. In fact, we find out later that Zechariah was actually killed in the temple grounds, assassinated by people who just got tired of his optimistic message because they said it's just not happening. Here's what Zechariah wanted them and you and I to know. One, that despite the fact of good in the distant future, God is always moving towards it. In fact, three reasons that you and I can have hope even in the midst of hardship right now. First, because God is sovereign, as you're gonna see, sovereign over time and nations. 
The story that Zechariah tells is of God out there that's controlling everything, moving through empires and seasons and sequences to accomplish his purpose. And that same God is working on your behalf today. Secondly, God's not just sovereign over time, but he's also moving history towards hope. It's always on this march towards the good that he promises. And finally, God has never failed to fulfill his promise. I'm going to show you. Uh, In Zechariah 2, 4, and 5, he gives us this first picture. He's talking about Jerusalem. And remember, they're looking around at all the devastation, and he says, go tell this young man. There's a dream where Zechariah is trying to measure the city. He wants to see how big it's gotten. And he says, Jerusalem will be a city without walls in the distant future because of the great number of people and animals in it. I put this in here just for those of you that ask the question of, will my pets go to heaven? There are animals in heaven. You see this. It will be so big, filled with people and animals, and I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I'll be its glory within. The message he's trying to get across with this future vision that's still yet to come is that God is creating a place of security and safety for you and me. A place where we don't need walls because he surrounds us. That ultimately one day God's plan is for your and my peace. The way that that's going to come is by the people doing what I showed you at the very beginning, returning to the Lord. uh, Learning to live again, to become the kind of people that could inherit a kingdom like that. To, To be the kind of people that lived in such a way of justice and mercy and love and peace that the kingdom would come and they would fit right in. That's, that's what God's been asking of us the whole time. Are you ready to become the kind of people that can receive my kingdom? Return to me and I'll return to you. Well then, Zechariah's got to give them some more pictures and more reasons to trust. And so he drops these little Easter eggs, you know like Easter eggs in movies? Little hints, uh, foreshadowings about the future to come. And the craziest thing, is he says it's not going to happen through uh, the way that you normally think. The restoration, the hope that you can have is going to come because I'm going to send not just a person, I'm going to come myself. Zechariah 2, 10 and 11 says this, Shout and rejoice, beautiful Jerusalem, for I am coming to live among you. Now, the people always believe there might be a, this Messiah. You know, we're just saying Jesus, Messiah. Or O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, this idea of an anointed one, a chosen by God person to come and deliver them and to return the kingdom back to glory. They always believed that there was a Messiah. What they never imagined is that the Messiah would be God himself. From where you and I stand, we look back on it and we go, makes sense. But for them, it was like one of those crazy dreams. How in the world God is going to come and live among us? How does that work? What we see is that Zechariah is pointing them forward to the Messiah in Jesus. So, a few of the messianic, we would call it, prophecies that are in Zechariah. Several of the things that you've heard all your life, or if you've been around the church, you've heard these in songs and you've heard them talked about before that describe Jesus coming as Messiah, they're all found in this book. It's quoted like 41 times in the New Testament. Different things that he predicted and then Jesus fulfilled. And I want to show you just a few of them because it's so wild. When you're wondering if you can trust God, you can go back to like how good and precise he was in bringing these things to fruition. So uh, first, Zechariah 9.9, it tells us that Jesus will enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And every Palm Sunday... We talk about the fact that Jesus rode into Jerusalem literally on a donkey. Do you remember this? He he speaks to them 500 years before. Your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Happened in Jesus. And then he tells us in Zechariah 11 that Jesus will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Remember this story? When it comes time for Judas to betray Jesus, he does it for 30 pieces of silver. Is that right here, 500 years before Christ, Zechariah says, so they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said, throw it to the potter, that handsome price which they valued me. That's sarcasm. 
the price of a slave in that time was 30 pieces of silver. The people valued Jesus like a slave, dispensable, not necessary. Use him and throw him away. And it says uh, in Zechariah that they threw this money, they throw it to the potter. Well, in, in Matthew's version, when he's talking about what happens after Judas, remember he betrays Jesus and then he goes back to the temple and he has this feeling of remorse and guilt and he gives the money back. It says he threw it back in the temple and then he walked outside and he killed himself. And you know where it says he killed himself? In the potter's field. Throw it to the potter. It's all these little moments that Zechariah is trying to show God is at work along history, moving us towards hope. It says that Jesus would be struck down and all the people would leave him. And in, in Zechariah 13, 7, it says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And then finally in Zechariah 12, 10, it says this, I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and the people of Jerusalem, and they will look on me whom they've pierced. And mourn for him as for an only son, the only son of God, pierced in the crucifixion. It didn't make any sense to the people at the time. These words came into their minds and flew out just as fast because they were stuck on those flying horses of Zechariah's dreams probably. But ultimately he was trying to show them that God is in control and you can trust him. He's bringing things to a conclusion. It's a beautiful piece of apop apocalyptic literature. Well, I'm going to end with this one verse that caught my attention this week. And I've been thinking about it and thinking about it and wrestling with it. And I think it might be the most important thing that you and I can take away as we start this Advent season. It's this verse. It's found in Zechariah 9, 12. After all the visions and after all the promises of Jesus, he says this, return to your fortress you prisoners of hope. Return to your fortress, prisoners of hope. And even now I announce that I'll restore twice as much to you. Here's what gets me. You can be a prisoner of war. You can be a prisoner of the justice system. You can be a, a prisoner of some debilitating disease or, or mental illness. You can be captive or prisoner by a lot of things. But I don't think I've ever heard anyone before say prisoner of hope. I'm trying to think about, like, what does it mean to be a prisoner of hope? What would it mean in your life? Like, what would it mean for you to be so captivated, so caught, so tethered to something else, something hopeful that you just could never get away from it? What would that look like in our lives? The studies that are done on prisoners are kind of fascinating. If you live in captivity for very long, uh, there's a common list of things. It doesn't matter if you're a prisoner in another country or in a jail, but prisoners all experience the same kind of psychological and ultimately biological issues. It starts with uh, this incredible amount of anxiety and dread and this inability, you lose your imagination, this inability to imagine anything other than your, your reality. If you live in prison, like an actual prison for a while, you start to get really comfortable with the monotonous day-to-day -day routine that has no joy, that has no peace. Prisoners often come to a place of forced compliance, we're told in a study I read by the APA, heightened irritability, repetitive thoughts, clinging behavior, and emotional withdrawal. All of that describes any person that you've ever met that's lost hope. Whenever we've lost hope, a belief, a foundational belief that things are going to be better in the future, that tomorrow really is better than today, when you've lost that, you've lost everything. And Zechariah says to the people, return to your fortress, return to the strong place, like the place of safety. That's what a fortress is. Uh, it's, it's a castle, it's a walled city. Return to a place where you can be at peace because someone else is in control. And when you do, you can become a prisoner of hope. Now, I was thinking about this. You can be a prisoner without hope, 
but you could be a, a prisoner with hope. And he says, be a prisoner of hope. What would it, what would it mean for you today to be a prisoner of hope? He tells us part of it is this belief that God's going to restore twice as much to those who've lost. T to be absolutely convinced that God's plan for you and for me is restoration. Now, I have to admit, some funky preacher types have used this verse and some others like it to build really bad theology, like name it and claim it, prosperity, you know, health, wealth, and happiness. It's just your, God's always trying to, to make you as healthy and happy as possible. Only problem is it's like not in the Bible. But, but the principle that's behind this, I think, is really important. Because over and over, in God's like working with humans, you remember we talked about God math a few weeks ago, that his math is just different. When God is working with us, there seems to be this idea built into the system that he wants to give back double for what we have lost. It, it happens with Job, it happens with Joseph, it happens in Jeremiah, it happens with Isaiah, over, with Elijah and Elisha over and over again. God says, what you have lost, I'm going to restore to you double. In fact, he built it into the law of the people. If, if you were caught in a Judaic law, if you were caught stealing, you had to return double whatever you stole. And that just got me thinking about this, this verse where Jesus is talking about the enemy, about our adversary, Satan, and he says he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came to give life. See, if you've lost hope, You've lost more than just a material or measurable thing. You've, you've lost the ability to believe for the future. You've lost the thing that can keep your sails inflated whenever life is tough. You've lost reason to move on. You've actually lost more than you've lost because you've lost not just the present, you've lost the future. And God says, I want to restore to you double. It's like, it's like he wants to give back to those of us who've lost hope in something, in him. He wants to give back to us that sense of certainty about the future that lets you get through tough days, that lets you move past setbacks, that lets you look around at the ruins and the devastation of the moment in your life and believe that God is at work even if you don't see it because he's a promise-keeping, never-changing God. If, if we could become prisoners of that kind of belief, those chains, they're worth submitting to, wouldn't they be? If you could believe, be fully convinced that God was at work in your life and for your good. Zechariah's promise to us, and while he was speaking to the people of Jerusalem and at that time, I think all of God's promises are available to us. The principle of this is for you and me as well. That if we will return to him, he will restore to us that which we've lost. And not just like, well, it's kind of like this. Uh, have any of you ever had your phone go kind of haywire, crazy, had some problem, and you had to do the dreaded factory reset? You know what I'm talking about? Or you have to get it back to factory settings and you lose everything. It's like, great, I'm starting over blank and I don't have the problem anymore, blank slate, but I've lost all of that. That would be just a return of what you've lost. He doesn't want to reset you to the factory dimensions. He wants to upgrade you. He wants to upgrade us to a, a sense of deep purpose and hope that can outlast anything. And the way he does it is by giving himself. That's why all these messianic prophecies of Jesus coming on the scene, while they were hard to grasp for the people at the time, that's why they matter to you and me. Because the foundation of our hope has to be bigger than just cross your fingers, I hope Cousin Eddie doesn't show up. It's gotta be based on something solid. The scripture actually tells us that Jesus is hope. The person of Christ is what you can lean the weight of your life on. 
and trust Him no matter the season, no matter the reality that you see right now. So I was thinking about maybe as we go to the communion table today, which is like the best picture of Christ and His faithfulness to us. Because he fulfilled all those prophecies, all those things that were said about him. And, the, and, and there are more. There's something like 300 prophecies about Jesus that he fulfilled, that one person did. The, the odds of that happening are absolutely astronomical. Uh, one, one guy, Stephen Stoner, a mathematician, figured it out. And it's something like 10 to the 23rd power, 23 zero. It's crazy. If God is that serious about keeping his promise... If he's that able to work through empires and kingdoms and and slaves and people with no power and people with great power, people with lots of hope and people who've lost all hope, if he's able to weave and work his way through history to reach the moment where Jesus Christ surrendered so that he could bring us hope, if he's able to do that, what are we worried about? Like, like, what are you, what are you really worried about? His invitation is to come find hope in him. And so that's what we're going to do today at this table. You're going to receive elements in just a moment, and they're, they're normal, everyday, mundane things, bread, juice. But somehow in our reenactment of what Christ did on that cross for you and for me, and then in his resurrection from the dead, in that we find hope. So I want to ask if, before we go to this table, before we we take the elements, I want to ask you to just join me in prayer for a moment. And I want to ask that you would identify the place in your life, if there's a place in your life where you've just lost hope, where you've stopped believing. Maybe you've started saying that dreaded phrase over and over, don't get your hopes up. It's going to fall through. Don't get your hopes up. This is just the way my life goes. Don't get your hopes up. That that diagnosis, no one ever comes back from that. Don't get your hopes up. We've we've had 17 Christmases apart. This year's going to be no different. If you're in that place, would you just pray that God might use this moment, this communion table, to remind you of where to place your hope in him and to breathe new and fresh life into it for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for prophets of old that had the courage to speak on your behalf when no one believed them, when all hope seemed lost, when the future seemed just impossible. And yet in their courage and in their conviction, they would speak truth on your behalf. Lord, some of us need that kind of conviction and truth today. There are people in this room, God, that have ceased to believe that the future can ever be better. They've bought the lie that this is as good as it gets, or I am as good as I can get, that that this is all there is. And may not look like it on the outside, but slowly, imperceptibly on the inside, we're dying. Like a prisoner who gets used to his walls and his chains, we've gotten comfortable living in a place of hopelessness. And Jesus, what I ask is that today, that you might work through this time, through this communion table, through our prayers, through songs. And you might begin to trade a set of shackles for being tethered to you, becoming a prisoner of hope in you. I thank you that you chose to become a prisoner yourself so that we could find freedom. That they couldn't take your life from you. They couldn't take from you anything that you didn't give because you were in control the entire time. And you were moving history toward hope so that we can have it today. 
Lord, as we receive these elements, would you nourish us? Would you strengthen us? Would your grace fill us in unexpected ways so that we might live as prisoners of hope in the future? We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.